Okay, I, I, suge uh, I suggest we start. Please have a seat. Welcome to the workshop on financial crisis organized by the Center for Financial Studies. Um, my name is Mirko Wiederholt. I'm head of the Department of Money and Macro here at Goethe University Frankfurt. And uh, we, we are very pleased and honored to have two of the most prominent macroeconomists of our time here today. Um, we have Professor Guillermo Calvo and uh, Professor no Nobuhiro Kiyotaki. Um, Guillermo Calvo, he's a uh, professor of economics, international and public affairs at Columbia University. Uh, he's worked uh, extensively on the macroeconomics of um, emerging market economies and transition economies. Uh, for example, he has helped us to understand capital flows and the balance of payment crisis. And he's also developed one of the most tractable models of price stickiness. Um, professor Nobuhiro Kiyotaki, he's professor of economics at Princeton. He's um, developed micro foundations of money. And he's also introduced or he's also developed business cycle models with financial frictions. And, uh, we are very honored to have them here today. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Nobuhiro Kiyotaki. Uh, afterwards, uh, Guillermo Calvo is going to speak. Uh, each of them is going to speak for 45 minutes, and uh, in between, we'll have 15 minutes of questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for coming here and having me here. And I, today I'd like to talk about the uh, financial crisis, especially the bank run. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the work with Mark Gartler. And so the, the, when we think about the recent crisis, uh, we observed the sort of two phases uh, in the crisis. Uh, one is the, from the summer of 2007, uh, a lot of people realized uh, financial sector uh, lost the money on subprime related assets like uh, mortgage backed security. Uh, and uh, so when then the, we see the uh, financial sector, uh, especially uh, big bank starts losing money and their security price, equity price starts falling. At the same time, uh, the spread is expanding. So if you look at the uh, picture, uh, the one of the stuff is the stock market variation of financial sectors. And you can see the, uh, uh, the summer of 2007 onward, the stock price starts falling and then drops a lot after the Lehman crisis. And, uh, and uh, simultaneously, the, if you look at the spread, this is the spread uh, constructed by the Simon Gilchrist and the Egon Zakrajcek. Basically, the, uh, looking at the uh, corporate bond and, uh, and the comparable treasury securities, uh, each, uh, each uh, try to uh, construct uh, synthetic treasury securities, which are the exactly the same maturity structures, and uh, taking the average. This is the total spread of average spread of corporate bond over the treasury securities. And uh, you can see the normal time, the spread is less than 2%. But uh, after the summer of 2007, the financial sector uh, starts losing money and the stock market starts uh, financial stock starts going down, uh, the, their spread starts going up. And uh, after the Lehman crisis, uh, spread shoots up uh, even close to the 8% level. And uh, so if you look at the, this uh, movement, initially the, it's like a financial sector lose money and their net worth starts going down. And then their ability to intermediate fund starts deteriorating and the spread between the loans or the corporate bond over, uh, over the treasury securities starts expanding. This is the uh, Bananke sometimes called the slow run. It's not the 
drastic run, but it's, it's a tension starts building up. Uh, and then after the Lehman crisis, it's uh, become real uh, run. It's not the usual bank run, but, and it, in this time, uh, the run is in the securitized market. And the securitized market, uh, the wholesale funding uh, stopped working well. And uh, like a mortgage backed security secondary market freeze, or the asset backed commercial paper market freeze. And uh, we do see the wholesale funding market uh, stop working well. And as we know, uh, we enter into the great recessions. So we uh, try to construct a theoretical framework to think about these two phases, a uh, slow run followed by the real bank run. And uh, how do we do that? And the economists often construct a simple model to think about the working. And the way we do it is the traditional financial accelerator style model and together with the bank run style model. And the bank run, the, one of the pioneering work is the Diamond Dibbic uh, model of the bank run. But the, and uh, that is designed to explain the retail banking, like a traditional bankers uh, or uh, the bunch of the depositors start worrying about <laughs> banks and then people start withdrawing the cash. And uh, this time it is more like a rollover risk in the wholesale funding market. So the bank run in our characterization is more like a stop it rolling over the short term funding, in especially in the wholesale funding market. And so in this sense, it's closer to the uh, literature of sovereign debt crisis, like a sovereign debt stop, uh, failed to roll over. And uh, so the slow run we are going to consider is the probability of bank run in future starts picking up, but the bank run hasn't happened yet. That's the way we try to formulate. And then one thing we realize is the anticipation of this run or the probability of bank run creeping up in future by itself is pretty contractionary because of asset price falling and the spread that's uh, expanding. So you don't need a big, the actual run, actually the fear of run by itself is a pretty uh, the contractionary for the macro economy. Uh, so that's the idea. And uh, this bank run happens, uh, de whether it happens or not, or the likelihood of happening depend upon the underlying macro structures, uh, which is the key variable is a leverage rate, how much the asset is financed by the debt, and also the uh, how much the asset can go down when the bank or the financial intermediary start selling the assets. So liquidation price we call. And uh, for detail, let's follow the along the model. So, so the model is the relatively simple uh, short run model, uh, macro model. And uh, short run, we take the total capital stock, asset supply K bar as given. And the part of the asset is intermediate by banks, uh, KB. And the part of the asset is directly financed by the household. And uh, this picture summarizes the how economy look like. Uh, basically, household has a saving. There are two ways to save. One is to save to the, through the bank. And uh, so they trust the bank and uh, uh, in, we call it a deposit. Uh, but any kind of short-term financing by the household is, you can call it deposit. And the banker is going to put together the deposit, the raised outside fund, together with the net worth to finance the, uh, the securities. And the here we take the, uh, the abstraction that the, between banks and business, there is not much financial frictions. Traditional literature, like Bernanke Gertler or my paper with John Moore, 
uh, we emphasize the borrowing constraint of business. Uh, like, uh, but the, here we try to focus on the borrowing constraint of the bank. So we actually ignore the financial friction between banks and uh, uh, business. Basically, the, you can think of the uh, business can pre-commit to pay all the gross profit to the bank, uh, like an equity contract. So the, the, the pr dividend is uh, contingent on the performance of business as well as the price can jump. So all the financing uh, we are going to consider is the security financing or equity financing. And uh, you can think of this bank as an uh, investment banker who financed the loan through the securities. And uh, when the household do not uh, trust the bank or uh, save in the bank, uh, there is a, another way to uh, finance, which is a direct financing. And, uh, but the, we assume the banker is good at making finance, but the household is not as good. So how do you formulate in that kind of idea? Uh, the way we did it is if bank is financing, effectively own the capital stock through the equity, uh, they get the dividend, and also capital is con uh, durables. Uh, but the household try to do the same thing in order to get the same dividend, uh, and uh, they need the extra input. Uh, we call it management cost. So basically, the household is less efficient than bank in financial in uh, intermediation financing. They are layman instead of professional. So the, the household have to spend extra resources, goods, uh, uh, management cost to finance. And uh, this management cost is a convex cost. So more fund is directly financed, less efficient, and effectively the price is going down uh, because a marginal buyer is not as good as the uh, bankers. So, so the, the picture I want you to remember is we have an indirect finance through the banks and the banker has a professional skill to fi finance the business and there is no uh, financial uh, friction between banks and the business. So, so effectively, a uh, banker own the business. Uh, while the alternative is a household try to do the same thing, but the, they are not as efficient. That's the picture uh, we try to uh, the formulate. And uh, so what's the deposit contract? Uh, the, there is a lot of micro foundation argument, but for this talk, uh, we just assume the, it's a non-contingent debt contract. Like, uh, and the, in without run, uh, they are going to pay the promised payment. But uh, with run, uh, the payment is going to be either promised payment or the total assets divided by the uh, depositors uh, pro rata. And the uh, Diamond Big model, actually the key constraint is a sequential service constraint. And, but here we don't have such kind of things. Actually, the, the, you don't have to first come for serve style constraint. Uh, everybody is going to suffer the loss equally. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so that's the failure of the rollover is the feature we try to formulate. But uh, at the beginning, uh, we assume the probability of bank run is zero and uh, the order bank run is unanticipated. Later, uh, when we start talking about slow run, uh, we are going to endogenize the probability of bank run. Okay, what's the uh, household problem? Household, uh, this is a little bit technical and uh, you don't have to worry about all the equations, but the, I will give you the intuitions uh, so household is maximizing expected discounted utility of consumptions. Uh, we use the log utility as an example. But so what's the budget constraint? Budget constraint is the consumption of household and deposit, and also direct financing, purchase of equity. But in order to purchase the equity as much as KH, 
they have to pay the extra management cost F. So that's the total cost of acquiring the, uh, the capital stock or equity. And what, how do you finance? Uh, the partly it's a wage. Uh, wage we assume is pro proportional to the aggregate productivity G. And, uh, but the deposit, you get the promised return. And uh, capital ownership, equity ownership, they have a dividend plus the resale value. And for the deposit, you get the standard oil equation, basically the marginal product, uh, marginal rate of substitution between today's consumption and future consumption is a so-called uh, stochastic discount factor. But the concerning the uh, equities, what is different is the rate of return on equity is not the today's price versus dividend plus tomorrow's price. Actually, the price cost of acquiring stocks includes the marginal adjustment cost, ma marginal management cost. So if the household tried to buy more equities and the marginal cost starts picking up, remember F is a convex functions, and uh, then marginal cost starts going up and the marginal return starts going down. And uh, that's the frictions uh, in facing for the household. And uh, what about the banks? Uh, banks are risk neutral people. And uh, in order to, and also uh, they may face the financing constraint in future. I'm going to explain where it come from. Uh, but the, in that case, actually the farm, uh, house, the bank has incentive to save everything. So in order to uh, the, to motivate the dividend payment, uh, without dividend payment, actually the bank can save so much that the day can save out of the financing constraint. So in order to limit their size of the net worth, we are going to assume the bank uh, retire uh, probability one minus sigma. Uh, probability sigma, you stay in the business. And uh, when the banker exit, they are going to consume the net worth. And uh, pro the banker's uh, life is relatively simple. Uh, the, during the lifetime, the, you just save everything and uh, you don't need anything. And then when you exit, uh, you, you eat everything. So it's like, a, it's like a, our life actually. <laughs> during the work, work period, you just walk. Uh, you don't eat much, actually. <laughs> and then when you retire, you have a big party, uh, and then, then, then exit, actually. And so that's the life of the bankers. And uh, when, when, the, <laughs> when, the, when the banker exit, the new one come in. Uh, otherwise, population of banker keep going down. So new banker bring in some little seed money. And uh, you can think of this endowment uh, as a wage. You work for a few period as a startup fund, but uh, we take it exogenous. So the, uh, the net worth of the newcomers is an endowment, but the uh, net worth of the surviving banker is the return from previous activities. Basically, if they own the equity as much as KB, T minus one, you get the dividend plus resale value. But the deposit finance, you have to pay the one plus interest rate, gross interest rate. The gap is the net worth. Net worth in using the mark to market. So this net worth is the mark to market uh, replacement cost of the balance sheet of the bank. So people may wonder where the bank's uh, financing constraint come from. Actually, the, this is the picture. Uh, so initially the bank, the dividend realizes and uh, they got the realized net worth from last period's activity or newcomer has an endowment and they raise the de deposit. And uh, using the deposit together with net worth, they buy the assets. Uh, so asset uh, price times the quantities of assets. If they honestly continue to uh, operate, the next period you pay the, repay to the depositors and uh, you get to retain the 
uh, the networks and either consume that with existing or continue the business. But the, there is a danger of diverting assets. So the reason banker may face the financing constraint is banker may steal the money. So, so this is very crude and uh, you might say it's almost ridiculous, but uh, actually the, my family business was, was banking actually. <laughs> so my grandfather was a banker and my father was a banker. And uh, when I was kids, actually the, the, my grandfather come to uh, visit us every two months or so and to take uh, my uh, my grandfather took me to the very nice restaurant, uh, probably the most expensive sushi restaurant in Tokyo, and uh, he said, "All you can eat." And uh, so me, me and my brother eat like a, a lot actually. <laughs> and, and then, then one day, actually, my my father complained, like, uh, "Do you know how much you eat? Like uh, three of you." It's almost as much as the uh, uh, monthly salary of uh, employee. And I was kind of shocked, but uh, at the same time, I was curious, how, how do my father find out? And, uh, and, uh, he was not there, so, <laughs> so probably my grandfather actually charged that bill to the bank. <laughs> That's why <laughs> he find out. So, <laughs> so <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so time to time, banker eat <laughs> the asset, but like a dinner. So and uh, but the here the you divert the assets for consumption. Uh, people will find out, unlike my grandfather. Uh, the so you have to shut down the bank. Uh, so unlike the Madoff, people take long time to find out. Uh, it take. Uh, next period, people find out. So, so the, here, the uh, in order for bank business to be viable, actually, banks' the franchise value uh, has to be at least as big as the uh, fraction of assets banker can divert. We assume the theta fraction of assets banker can divert without uh, getting caught, and uh, so that's the incentive constraint. And uh, this incentive constraint, uh, the, uh, the value of the bank is the net present value of the dividend or the, uh, at the time you consume. And uh, so, so we try to uh, derive the financing constraint. And uh, what we got is the, this kind of equation. I don't want to go too much in equation, but uh, this is something called the Verma equation. The value of the bank is the next period you may exit with probability one minus sigma. In that case, the, they eat, so consumption value. But the sigma probability people continue, so then tomorrow's uh, franchise value. And uh, the franchise, uh, the every technology is constantly done to scale. So bankers' behavior, you can summarize by the uh, scale by the network. So Franchise value divided by replacement cost is sometimes called Tobin's Q. And this is the Tobin's Q of the banking business. What's the Tobin's Q? Discount net value times the tomorrow's net worth. Tomorrow's net worth grow like a, a growth rate of the net worth. And uh, tomorrow's net worth is worth uh, one for one if you exit, but the continue tomorrow's Tobin's Q is the value of the net worth. And uh, what is the net worth growth rate? It depends upon leverage multiple uh, assets divided by the net worth. How much you beef up the uh, asset size relative to the net worth by borrowing money or raising fund from outside. And uh, if you raise fund outside, you earn the spread between the assets return on equity uh, minus the deposit interest rate. And uh, here the banker is specialist so they don't need the extra management cost. They have a management skills. So if you solve this one, you get the simple sort of the endogenous leverage constraint. Basically the uh, net worth assets to net worth ratio, we call ma leverage multiple, is uh, a decreasing function of the amount people can divert. 
and the increasing function of something called the excess value of the uh, asset, which is related to the spread. For detail, please look at the, our paper, but the, at the end of the day, what you get is the uh, amount the banker can finance depend upon the uh, net worth of banking sector times the endogenously determined uh, leverage multiple. And what is the aggregate net worth of the banker? That is the continuing people's bankers' uh, net worth plus the newcomers, uh, the, the endowment. And uh, the lastly, we have a good market clearing consumption plus retiring bankers' uh, consumption plus the management cost is the uh, return from capital stock or labor or the newcomers' endowment. And uh, what is a bank loan? As uh, the, this is the, we assume the ex ante people don't think about it, but the ex post, the household or the depositor decide whether to roll over deposit or not. And if you do that, the, if the banker do not, uh, the roll of, uh, the depositor do not roll over the bank, the deposit, then banker has to start selling the asset. And the asset price starts going down how much asset price can go down. It depends upon what happened after the bank run. Uh, the, if the net worth become negative uh, in the fire sale price, this Q star is the event of bank run, how much asset price go down. And uh, if they become insolvent uh, in the event of bank run, then the, the banker, existing banker is going to wipe out. And uh, some people think like a popular write, writing, like a Krugman, sorry, <laughs> but uh, he, he called there is a sharp distinction between insolvency and the liquidity shortage. But the truth is that's not true. Basically, the, uh, the all depends upon asset price, and asset price is equilibrium price. And as during the bank run, as asset price can fall, and many banker can become insolvent. And actually, when you look at the Friedman Schwartz classic book of the monetary history of the United States, uh, the great contraction chapter, actually he said, the, like a, they said, because the Fed is not aggressive enough to, to provide liquidity during the contraction, uh, Great Depression, the initially banker has just a shortage of liquidity, but later, uh, asset price drops, especially the co uh, long-term bond price collapse, and uh, many bankers become insolvent. So this the Q start depend upon the uh, market conditions as well as central bankers uh, uh, conditions. And if there is no central banker, temporary banker is going to wipe out. And the new banker starts coming in, we assume next period, and uh, after next period, everything becomes kind of gradually healing through the net worth accumulation. But during that period, the, the banker's asset is low, which means the household has to hold a lot of asset, which has a higher marginal cost. And the asset valuation using the oil equation, you can compute uh, the equilibrium asset price. And uh, the, in order to give some feel for the uh, the how model works, I give you some uh, calibrations. So calibration is not my specialty, but uh, uh, the two things which is slightly uh, mysterious is the, uh, the how much you can steal, and also what is the newcomer's the uh, endowment. And uh, this, we don't have a hard data. So what we did was to try to hit the leverage ratio. So leverage ratio, uh, multiple is about 10. Asset size is 10 times as big as net worth. And the spread between the assets return and the uh, deposit return is 1% uh, annual rate. So if we use the two target to pick the two parameters, this is the what you get. What's the impact uh, on the productivity shock, say Z, productivity dropped by 5% and gradually recovering. What's going to happen to the economy? And uh, 
if you look at the evolution of net worth, you can see the productivity shock hits, the banker gets less returns, and the net worth starts going down. And the net worth go down, their lending capacity go down. So, so then the household have to hold more assets, but the household is not as good as banker. So the price starts falling, Q starts falling. When Q starts, asset price starts falling, net worth starts going down. And when net worth starts going down, and if the banker has a big debt to roll over, and the depo deposit obligation is bigger than the newcomer's endowment or dividend, they have to roll over the debt, which is called the debt overhand. In that case, net worth drops faster than asset price. And uh, as a result, despite Q is dropping, uh, the asset demand go down. Typical as the, the model, demand is, uh, if price go down, demand go up. But the truth is, the, if the, the buyer has a big debt overhang, asset price drops, actually their net worth drops faster, and their demand can go down. Uh, that's where the propagation comes. We emphasize in credit cycle in that kind of thing. And you can see the asset price drops, and the net worth drops a lot, like a 50% instead of 5%. As a result, the banker has to contract. 25%, and output drops, net output, output minus the management cost drops like a 6%. So you get a little bit of propagation in terms of output, but uh, five versus six. So you may say it's not that big, but the uh, truth is the, this is the case, no uh, bank run happens. But here uh, we have a, so another equilibrium, when negative shock hits, there is an equilibrium which economy is slowly coming back. Uh, but there is another equilibrium which the run can happen. The run variable is basically the how much the uh, net worth is uh, small relative to the debt obligation, uh, the assets return is small, uh, sh uh, short of the debt deposit obligations in the event of bank run. And the normal case, this is positive, uh, is uh, you don't have a, uh, the shortfall. But uh, during the crisis, Z is low, uh, Q star is low, then the, this bank run become a uh, possibility. So if you have that, and the bank, this is the shortfall, shortage of the assets return over the deposit uh, in the event of bank run, uh, its normal steady state is negative, which means the bank is not vulnerable to the run. But during the negative shock hit, the run become possibility, and actual run happens, output drops. And the banking sector, in our case, is a systemic, so temporarily collapse, and then starts recovering slowly. And uh, so you can see the more dramatic uh, collapse in the output which is the output drop is more than 10% instead of 6%. And uh, so you can see the, how the bank run can generate a big mess uh, in our economy. Eventually it will come back, but uh, it, take, it has a mess. And uh, so far we take the bank run as the unanticipated event, but the, if you, it happens so often, people should expect bank run is a possibility in future. So here we take the uh, extension, uh, we extend the model so that the bank run is people anticipate. In the event of bank run, the depositor will get either promised return or the uh, total return in the event of bank run, liquidation return divided by the, uh, the, the promise. Uh, so X is sometimes ca called coverage ratio. Coverage is bigger than one, then there is no bank run but the coverage is less than one in the event of run, then the uh, depositor is going to lose. And uh, we try to endogenize the probability of run by using the dynamic gains, and turns out to be it's very difficult, so we just did the shortcut. Basically, the, we put the reduced form probability of run as a, a decreasing function of coverage. And uh, if coverage is 100%, the run doesn't happen. 
But the cover rate is less than 100%, the run happens, and uh, we use the simple proportional rules. And uh, once you have this uh, uh, possibility, then the deposit promised to return has to be compensated for the potential loss for the run. And also the franchise value will drop uh, because of the uh, franchise value is subject to the survival. So let's look at the picture. This is the picture taking account endogenous run. So when negative shock, 5% shock hits, the probability of bank run become positive, 2%. And uh, then comparing to the no run, uh, uh, no run the basically the un people don't anticipate the price drop by 5%. But uh, if people anticipate run is possibility, even run doesn't happen, the price drops like a seven, eight percent, and the bank contraction is not 25 percent, but nearly 60 percent, and the output drops uh, more significantly, like eight uh, percent instead of six percent. You can see the when people uh, start anticipating run, then the first deposit has to be compensated, and also the bank contract more because of asset price drops and net worth drops more. This is the exactly what we observe in Italy or uh, Spain, uh, Spanish, the banking system. Even if bank run is stopped, but still people are worrying about bank run, the spread starts going up, and the net worth starts going down, and the franchise value starts going down, and the economy contract. And uh, if we put together this uh, expected run with actual run, this is what happens. This is the possibility of run become positive, and then actual <laughs> run happens in the fourth quarter, and at uh, this point, the banking system collapse, and then takes long time to recover, and the economy starts healing very gradually. And if we put together with a little data, uh, this dotted line is the spread uh, computed by uh, the data, the Gilchrist and the, the Crytek. This time we use the excess bond premium, which is basically the, the bond spread, uh, corporate bond spread, which is not explained by the borrowers uh, distant to default, like uh, uh, Robert Martin's model. And uh, so the residual spread is the excess bond spread. And uh, so you can see the uh, Bear Stearns collapse and then Lehman collapses, the spread shoots up to 2% level, which is not explained by the default risk of the borrowers. It's the lender side. So, and uh, our model has a spread, like uh, when the negative shock hits, the spread starts going up, but uh, then bank run actually happens the spread shoots up and then gradually decays. And uh, in terms of the uh, franchise value, this is the uh, stock market variation of financial sectors uh, we showed before. And this is the model, like a negative shock hits, value drop, but actual bank run happens temporarily, they are going to wipe out. And uh, so by looking at the both the slow run, negative shock hits and the banker lose the money and the net worth drops and spread going up and the economy starts going down and the possibility of bank run is the become positive. So that's the one, one uh, thing. But the actual run happens, the spread shoots up and the, economy, uh, the banking sector temporarily collapse. And uh, so by putting together this uh, uh, an anticipated run and the slow run and the actual run, you can have a better picture of the recent crisis. <laughs> and uh, so the, this is the basic things. And uh, here is some uh, policy remark. And uh, uh, the, so the traditional solution of bank run is a deposit insurance. But the, in our model, the 
deposit insurance by itself is a disaster <laughs> because of the bank just starts stealing money and the depositor don't worry about it. And uh, so this is complete disaster actually. So, so the, you need the regulation actually. So if you uh, have a, a deposit insurance, you need the regulation to stop the, uh, the moral hazard. In our case, it's moral hazard is so strong uh, that it's going to cause the huge trouble. And the uh, other way to do it, people often argue uh, recently, is a macro prudential policy. Basically, the capital requirement. The, we, our model has a natural upper bound of the leverage. The leverage is determined by this uh, little complicated formula, but the, basically, this is the upper bound of leverage. Uh, when the incentive constraint of not diverting assets is binding. And uh, if the spread is positive, actually, it's banker try to maximize the uh, asset size uh, subject to this incentive constraint. And uh, uh, the, if the government try to reduce the spread, they, uh, the, uh, the, the leverage, you can do it by regulation. You cannot go above that, but you can reduce the natural uh, limit of the leverage by regulation. But if you do that, the basically the fund goes to the household who is not as good as the banker, so the economy becomes less efficient. So basically the, the capital requirement by itself can reduce the leverage and reduce the likelihood of run but at the same time, steady state cost is going up uh, because of more fund goes through the household. Uh, how about the lender of last resort? Lender of last resort in our case is actually buying the risky assets, which the government did uh, during the crisis. Like uh, during the uh, crisis, the Fed starts buying the risky assets. Uh, Bank of Japan bought actually equity. And uh, so, so if you buy the equities, and uh, remember the government may be not as good as bank in buying the equities. And uh, so they are subject to the same management cost uh, frictions like a household. The difference from household is the government can influence the price or they can support the price uh, higher than the uh, liquidation price. So you can reduce the likelihood of land. But when you reduce the likelihood of run, actually the leverage go up. So the, therefore, even if the run is less likely or even you can stop completely uh, by aggressive end of last resort intervention, uh, the leverage is going up means the, uh, the financial accelerator, uh, usual credit cycle style accelerator go up. So, so the, the, you have an ex ante uh, regulations as well as ex post intervention. Both are widely used in central banking now, but the, both have uh, some cost and benefit. Uh, the, you, by having the capital requirement, economy become less efficient in a steady state sense. But uh, in the ex post intervention, uh, the leverage go up and therefore the financial accelerator become bigger. So economy become more volatile. So, so these are the, uh, some policy implications. And uh, I'd like to stop here.